Greetings, everyone. Happy Monday night, March 25th here on the Wolverine.com YouTube channel if you're watching live. In our video feeds after the fact or listening via the podcast feed, Anthony Broom here along with Chris Ballas and Clayton Safey as we are every Monday night at 6 p.m. A lot to get to today, but of course, this is going to be a <clears throat> basketball-heavy show as Michigan has its successor to Jawan Howard. Dusty May has been hired, signed a five-year deal that averages... $3.75 million. Uh, he will be introduced at a press conference on Tuesday. Of course, the Wolverine will have full coverage of that. We'll talk about Dusty May coming in. We'll talk about maybe some of the guys that come with him. Uh, other things we're hearing about you know, assistant coaching staff, maybe guys in the transfer portal that played at Michigan last year and decisions to be made. I will also get into some spring ball talk, but uh, Chris, Clayton, welcome back. Hey, good to be back uh, on a Monday night. I got my throwback Michigan basketball shirt on. The Adidas logo wore off, which some, for some reason doesn't surprise me. Uh, you know, this is an old shirt, man. This is, goes back to the John Beeline days when he let the media come in and go through some drills and some camps. I just wish Clayton wouldn't have been like three years old at that time so he could have shot the lights out in the shooting drills uh, like I see on YouTube. You know, maybe, maybe dunked back then. Who knows? Did you ever get rim, Clay? No comment. I mean, I have gotten rim. I, I don't have to say, uh, you know, what kind of foot. Uh, okay, you know, I got you. Okay. Well, regardless, uh, you know what? It's just nice to be encouraged by the direction of Michigan basketball. Not to sound like Jalen Rose here, but uh, I'm glad that, you know what, we got a guy in here that maybe can bring this, turn this program back around, right? Which I think is what Jalen Rose said after after John Beeline had been to, to championship games and won, and won titles and stuff like that. But this time it's true. And uh, Dusty May, I think, is the right guy. Fantastic that uh, Ward Manuel and those guys and everybody else uh, who was involved was able to land him over Louisville. Uh, this is still a destination job, guys, uh, regardless of what some of the rivals might say and think. This has been an extremely successful basketball program over the years. Great to have him in town. Yeah, turn things around after the first back-to-back uh, -back 30 win seasons in program history. You just, just have to laugh at that, but... Yeah, I mean, Michigan gets their guy. Uh, the top real guy that's on the move this this time around, this cycle. Um, you know, so uh, somebody asked this on the message board the other day, like grade the hire. You know, I gave it an A because this is what the cycle is. I mean, you could argue that, you know, maybe they could have got somebody who's had success at a high major, but those guys just don't seem to be available right now for any of the jobs here, Louisville being one of them, Vanderbilt was also in the mix for Dusty May and several other high majors uh, there. So Ward Manuel, John Beeline, the whole committee. I was down in Fort Lauderdale as well over the weekend, so I was helping trying to seal that deal, and we were able to get him on Saturday night. Were you really in Fort Lauderdale? I was. That's fantastic. I so. was securing the bag, and we brought <laughs> Dusty home. <laughs> he wasn't really, but it wouldn't stun me if Clayton had been uh, camped out of the house or something once he got word. That if I knew, if I knew they were down there, exactly where they were. Trip. Trip. Did you golf down there? I did not. Okay, well, you still had a good time, so I'm glad you had fun. But uh, you come back, you see that Dusty May is going to be there. Great hire, Anthony. Uh, really, a really good hire. Yeah, and we'll get into the hire here. But before we do that, I want to, of course, uh, let everyone know we are brought to you tonight by the Wolverine special commemorative edition of our uh, national championship magazine. What I'm holding here, uh, if you're watching the video version, is the hardcover edition of the book. Uh, it's outstanding. We had so much fun putting it together. There are still a ton of copies available over on the WolverineOnDemand.com. We do have our inventory down there at the uh, Durham office, so those are ready to be shipped out. Uh, if you missed out on the pre-order window, again, uh, you know, 140, uh, the hardcover edition, 144 ad-free uh, premium glossy pages. You've got the hard, the hardback cover. We've got the uh, you know, in-depth features on Jim Harbaugh, Blake Corum, JJ McCarthy, all of these foundational guys. Obviously, we saw Michigan's Pro Day the other day, kind of a passing of the baton to a certain extent with the program and, and all of those guys that now hand things over to this next iteration of what Michigan football looks like. But uh get your get your hands on uh to, on, on this keepsake of ours uh, that we put out. A lot of work went into it. A lot of people have gotten so many uh, great compliments behind the scenes and you know, obviously on the record too. So join that, um, join all those people and add that to your collection today. Head on over to the WolverineOnDemand.com. The description for that uh, will also be below in this video here. Uh, well, let's start with Dusty May. Um, Chris, I want to throw one out to you first and then Clayton, I have an additional one to throw out to you. 
Uh, take us through the process that led Michigan to Dusty May because I had one person describe it to me as quote unquote shockingly competent the way that they were able to to land him and and reel in the big fish and really it seemed like they had their eyes set on Dusty at the top with a pretty wide gap maybe not a wide gap between everyone else but they had their guy they identified him and in comes John Beeline to help close the deal and Michigan has its new coach. Yeah, it's funny that people don't want to give him any credit. And uh, people say we don't want to give Ward Manuel credit, which is absolutely not true. We credited everybody for this, including Ward Manuel, who we've been critical of. And we we will continue to be critical of people that we think deserve it, whether it's John Beeline, which usually never was, except for maybe a year or two. I remember that game against Ohio State uh, when you were really starting to question the direction uh, when they lost at home. And then, boom, they turn it around and go on the run. And you're like, man, you know, because there was a lot of heat. But then all of a sudden, we always knew he was a great basketball coach right anyway i digress uh basically what happened is on saturday as you guys know um i was up north on a water slide had the phone with me and uh, we had gotten word that michigan was going to be in florida there were all kinds of rumors about dusty may in louisville and we knew that dusty may was high on the list on high on ward manuals list uh, we know that last wednesday uh, that John Beeline was contacted for the first time Wednesday to be part of the search. Um, and he said, okay, uh, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And uh, he had his own list of names. Uh, Dusty May, I know that he was high on him and speaking to people extremely close to him, uh, as well as Ward Manuel being high on him as well. So it uh, seemed like he had emerged as the number one candidate. And when Louisville was extremely confident, Michigan knew that they had some, that they were going to be meeting with him on Saturday as well and have an opportunity here. Uh, John Beeline, who has a place down in Florida now, drove over, uh, was part of that as well. Uh, there are all kinds of BS uh, narratives out there about, you know, who turned on Ward Manuel to Dusty May and all this crap. I wish I could tell you guys what we know uh, about Dusty May's time at Eastern Michigan and stuff and, and things like that, but we aren't going to go there. Uh, what we will say is that Dusty May became, became a candidate. We know that he loves John Beeline and uh, one of the guys that it was a good friend of his that used to work with him. Who's was a friend of mine said that he used to use John Beeline stuff uh, and send it to him when they would compare notes. Uh, he studied John Beeline, had great respect for him. So him being there was absolutely huge. No matter what anybody tells you, John Beeline should be the consigliere of this program. Like Jay Wright at Villanova, like Tom Izzo will be at Michigan state. Yeah. People are going to hold that half season at, uh, at Cleveland against him when he had his own heart issues and stuff like that, feel free. But that was the golden age of Michigan basketball. But anyway, they go down there. Um, you know what? They have their conversations. John Beeline had his questions. Ward Manuel had his questions and Dusty May had his questions. The interview went late fellas. And at about nine 45, right after we closed the water park there, um, we get a, a text that uh, Dusty's done at the same time that uh, that uh, Woj dropped the Woj bomb uh, for ESPN and said that Dusty May was going to be the next Michigan coach. So uh, just a fantastic get. I think he's a great fit. Everything we've heard about him is that he's a uh, an outstanding person. B he is a basketball junkie who is going to work like crazy. My buddy who worked with him told me that he's going to hit it like Bill Bo Schembechler hit the uh the michigan football program in 1969 relentless and uh with a will to win immediately sounds like he could very well bring several of his florida atlantic players with him we know that he's going to hit the portal as well so very good hire was number 1a on the list they got him congratulations to michigan this is a huge hire and i think that he's going to do a great job here all right well clayton let me bounce to you now i mean i wanted to add, you know when it comes to dusty may the candidate and now Dusty May, the Michigan head basketball coach. What are what do you like about what he brings to the table uh, from you know a profile standpoint and what Michigan needs uh, in its next head coach? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it is a fantastic hire. I, I would grade it an A. You know, the one question I would say is, you know, doing it at this level is different. You know, for some guys, some guys work out, some guys don't. Obviously, at some point, you have to make that jump if you're going to. And all the guys like a beeline and everybody else did. So, you know, you can't hold that against him. But what he did at six years uh, in six years at Florida Atlantic is pretty ridiculous. Uh, you know, he took them to unprecedented heights. They had never had uh, three straight winning seasons in league play. They they do so four straight years, his, his final four years. And speaking of final fours, that, uh, you know, getting there in 2023 
extremely improbable, extremely impressive that they were able to do that. They followed up this year with the second winning uh, season in program history with 25 wins. And that was a disappointment uh, relative to expectations. And Dusty May said so after they lost in, in overtime to Northwestern in the first round of the tournament. So, but you know, the way he was able to build it, the way that after last year, and all the success they had with standout players, you know, like some of them that could be coming to Michigan. He was able to retain that entire roster. Great relationships with all those guys. Identified guys like Vlad Golden, who's who's from Russia, um, you know, so has a really good eye for talent and a good evaluator as well. I like that about him. I like the style he plays. You know, I think Michigan had about seven or eight power forwards on the roster each and every year over the last five or so. That's not going to be the case with Dusty May. There's going to be a lot more guards. Then forwards, um, you know, they, they play, uh, you know, they prioritize shooting, you know, they play with space and pace, you know, is kind of the philosophy defensively. They don't like to help all that much. Sounds uh, familiar to, you know, uh, what we saw with Luke Yaklich at the end of John Beeline's tenure there at Michigan and how good they were. You need good individual defenders to do it, but there's a lot to like ad- about Dusty May. And then you add in the element, like I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Louisville wanted him. Vanderbilt wanted him, you know, not that Vanderbilt's some great program, but I mean, basically everyone this cycle that had an opening had him at the top of their list. And it was Michigan, despite the rumors on this platform or that platform that was able to reel him in. Dusty May talked on a radio show today and said he was reading it on Twitter, too. He's like, it's not true at all. I haven't accepted anything. Uh, I have a meeting tonight in person. This is him talking about his his day on Saturday. With Michigan, he was impressed with the group they sent over. Obviously, we, you know, Chris, you just talked about that with, with Coach B and everything else, and they were able to get it done. So I, there's a lot to like, and he now has a lot of work ahead of him, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah, and to me, when I look at the Dusty May hire too, you know, a lot of people, something I saw a lot of throughout the search and throughout certainly on Saturday is, oh well, I don't know if I think Dusty May might be overrated. You know, would we even talk about him if they don't beat Memphis last year? And, and I'd say, why deal in the hypothetical? The fact is that they did make the NCAA tournament run they did last year. Winning one game in the tournament is difficult enough, let alone winning four of them. You know, to take the national runner up in San Diego State to a game where you lose by one point. Uh, and then obviously we saw, you know, this year, you know, um, a bit given what expectations were, a little bit disappointing uh but on the same token you know beat a couple tournament teams you know they beat arizona who's still in the big dance um he did this at florida atlantic he didn't do it at florida or florida state or some you know any other type of school that has a you know basketball pedigree he took them from chicken you know what and made chicken salad out of it and now again i think that something that strikes me with all this is that given the fact that he was maybe the the highest caliber uh, or that white whale of this cycle. I mean, I actually thought the 3.75 million, uh, the salary number that Michigan threw out there yesterday was kind of interesting to me because one, I don't know that they typically include salary in their releases. And two, it kind of seems like a little bit cheaper than what uh, some of the, the experts out there thought that they'd be able to get him there at, which tells me that not only was he sold on Michigan being, potentially better job than, you know, your Louisville's of the world, but whatever was part of that conversation, whether it be admissions, whether it be the transfer portal, whether it be recruiting. And I do think, you know, the bones of what he's going to want to do still operate on the recruiting trail. There's been this narrative that he built Florida Atlantic out of the portal. I, I think their big three were all homegrown guys, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, to me, I think that whatever Michigan's pitch to him was uh, one encouraging that he's you know signed on for that and two the fact that you could get the best candidate in this coaching carousel so to speak to sell you know to sell that type of vision to him must mean that they michigan might have its you know what together a lot more than people are giving them credit for yeah um you know what i think they found a guy who thought that that it was his right fit right And, and sometimes you get those and sometimes you don't fellas but um, this time they, around, they had a guy that thought, OK, this is where I want to be. His son was born in Ann Arbor when he was at Eastern Michigan at one of the Michigan hospitals. Uh, again, he still has some ties here. I'm sure of it. Um, but, I, you know, a lot of people said he didn't want to be in that fishbowl. He didn't want to be that guy. Like, remember when Nick Saban landed in Alabama when he was hired and he had a bunch of uh, 
I was going to say hillbillies, but I don't think that's fair. Uh, a bunch of fans chasing the plane and, and you know, <laughs> coming after him and running after him when he got off the tarmac. Uh, that was crazy, a crazy scene. Uh, you're not going to get that with Michigan basketball, and you're not going to get that with many schools, frankly. But you know what? At a place like Louisville or at a place like Kentucky or something like that, uh, automatically, you know, if you do something – where they don't like it, they're going to let you know about it. Uh, I think Michigan fans are going to be patient. Michigan fans can be passionate about their teams. And I will go and single out Atlanta uh, in the Final Four. You could not get a ticket. There were so many Michigan fans down there, fellas, in 2013. When I went to Staples Center for in L.A. for the tournament, uh, they took over Staples Center. Everywhere I've been, they were so well, well represented, whether it was, I think it was Wichita, Kansas, Des Moines, Iowa. There were tons of Michigan fans there. So is it more of a fickle fan base? Yes. But when John Beeline was there and Clay and, and Anthony, you guys were both there, that place came down and was packed most nights, especially in Big Ten play when uh, John Beeline's teams were humming. And I was just watching some clips that Nick Stauskas put on Twitter. Uh, God, I miss that guy. He was so fun to watch and the offense and how well coached those teams were. Uh, I envision Dusty May by the time he's 55 years old, where John Beeline was uh, when he came to Michigan, being one of those guys that, okay, he's got every other part of his program down. Now he's going to be an X's and O's guru as well. I think he's already good there. I think he's got room to get better, and I think he will. So extremely excited about the hire, just everything I've heard, and uh, the unsolicited praise from Indiana fans, and, and not just fans, but one of my colleagues who I respect more than anybody, Mike Pegram, who I used to work with uh, over at Rivals, said, he just sent me an email. He said, you're going to find out that this guy is pretty special. And it, it does remind me a little bit of the beeline hire when people were coming unsolicited. You're going to love this guy. He's going to do a great job there. Uh, some hires you don't know, right? Like we were hopeful on Jawan Howard. We were hopeful on Brady Hoke. We knew J Jim Harbaugh was a, a, a home run. We knew that John Beeline was a home run. I'm hopeful plus with Dusty May. I feel really, really good about the hire. Yeah, I think fit is a word we're going to hear a lot tomorrow at his introductory press conference. The interview he did, and I'll give him credit to, 106.3 FM in Palm Beach. Go seek that out. We wrote an article on it uh, just a little bit ago. But a couple of things. One, the way that this guy who is the host, and he's the play-by-play -play announcer, it sounds like, for, for Florida Atlantic, the way he interacted with Dusty and the respect that he clearly has for him it was really telling as well. I'm sure this guy would reach out as well and say some really good things about Dusty May from a media standpoint. But, um, you know, but Dusty said – like you said, Chris, his son was born here. They lived here for, for a year when they were at Eastern Michigan. He understands the brand. He understands what Ann Arbor is all about. And when he was down the road and kind of in the shadow at Michigan, they understood what, uh, you know, the passion that Michigan fans have, like you're talking about. And, you know, I think that's going to be big for him. Now, I would hope, you know, that he was given some assurances and part of Ward Manuel's pitch was the support that they're going to have and, Maybe it would be easier to get somebody in or, or you know, the NIL program. We already see Champion Circle opening up a, a fund there for, you know, fans to donate and they can donate to the NIL. But the facilities, I know that they met in Fort Lauderdale, not in uh, Ann Arbor. And but now he's here. He's probably sitting in the or, or you know, on the phone and, and recruiting and everything and walking around the PDC right now. But the facilities are night and day compared to what he had at Florida Atlantic, his office from what I read at Florida Atlantic backs up into a janitor's closet and there's like construction going on constantly. He said, it's like, uh, you know, it sounds like a dentist chair or something across the other side of the wall. And they would have to sneak into the football buildings weight room if they wanted to, you know, get a lift in over there when they could, if the football team was on spring break or whatever. So that's what they're dealing with. The $33 million was the budget for Florida Atlantic's athletic department last year. Michigan's was 215 million. So uh, I just think he saw that. And probably John Beeline's talked about this too. And I'd like to hear Dusty May's thoughts on it. But being at a football school is attractive for a basketball coach. Beeline talked about how it was kind of always his goal to get one of to get to one of those football powers. So I want to hear Dusty May's uh you know thoughts about that as well. But fit is going to be that word. It just felt like it was the right fit. He's from Peoria, Illinois. He's a Midwest guy. He said he watched the Big Ten every day of his life growing up. So it just feels like the perfect fit. Yeah, and that's the biggest key with all of it. And again, uh, maybe we should set an over under for the amount of times we hear fit tomorrow. Um, I just said it like half. Time, so. What's the over yeah, under? Okay. On, what's the over under on Dinkelman? Uh, probably point five. We just went over. <laughs> so 
Um, the one Nobody thing that's apparent that. to me, yeah, we've, we've, we've gotten a couple questions about play style. I mean, when you just look at kind of the profile of what his teams, at least the last two years have looked like, um, they do play smaller. It's kind of beeline esque in that regard. I think they had, um, you know, Janelle Davis was playing the four. He's like six, four, two Oh five or something like that. So, um, you know, they do play smaller. They're going to take a lot of threes. It just, when you talk about guys that are beeline esque, uh, you even look at the, the offensive style, um, you could see some of the similarities there. And he's going to drop stuff to get guys good shots. Uh, defensively, you're going to see a lot of drop coverage, it seems like. And uh, it also seems like a guy that's going to tailor the team to the strengths of the personnel. So we'll have to see what that happens there. And obviously, a lot of that's going to come down to what the roster looks like. And as of right now, uh, there are four scholarship guys that do have eligibility to return. Um, Terrence Williams, Damari Burnett have a fifth year to use if they elect to do so. Will Cheddar still has two years of eligibility. Jace Howard still uh, technically around. We'll see what he uh, winds up deciding to do. And then you've got guys in the transfer portal for Michigan. You've got this big three uh, from Florida Atlantic that has that will have options now, you would think. And whether some of them come with Dusty, all of them come, uh, remains to be seen. But, Chris, I mean, what's the next step here in terms of putting a roster together? Because I don't know. It's going to take a lot of work for them to get to the 13 uh, allotted scholarships. but you'd have to think that they'll be able to, you know, there's a lot of work to do, like you said, very quickly. And you don't need 13, really. You know, it's, I was watching a game the other day. You know, John Beeline used to play seven guys sometimes. Ideally, you'll have more than that, right, especially if you want to compete for a championship. But um, to me, a, a guy like Will Cheddar is going to find this very attractive. As he'll be a role player, I think, for Dusty May. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, I, we've heard good things about the potential of Terrace Reed coming back. Uh, who knows? But we'll find out. Uh, we do believe he will bring some of his guys here. The one thing I will say is that if he does bring those guys as tran grad transfers from Florida Atlantic, that then the following year is going to be a big one, right? But Christian Anderson is a kid who committed. I'm going to be writing a, a story about him uh, tomorrow morning that wants to stay. And uh, he's looking for the right fit. And uh, you know what? He loves Michigan. And he, he loved Juwan Howard, obviously, and they identified him earlier, early in the process. Um, but I think they are pretty encouraged by the, uh, in trading texts with his dad, pretty encouraged by the hire. So uh, Darrell Brooks, uh, Clay, Clayton Safey's guy, you know, over at Catholic Central. I think they used to play together at one time. Is that true? Back in the day? Uh, no. No. Okay. Well, no. all right. But uh, regardless, uh, you know what? These are guys that I think are, are extremely um, really committed to the school and interested in seeing what kind of culture uh, Dusty, man, we use that word a lot, guys, you know, Juwan Howard used it a lot, but it was clear that there were some cracks in the foundation by the end of it. I think it was time. I think most people would agree. It was uh, really time for a change in a different direction, even though Juwan Howard did some good things here, but culture is everything. As John Beeline taught us, you can't have the dust ups, right? With your, strength coach. You can't have uh, some of the stuff that was going on in the building uh, that we won't discuss that was really disappointing to hear. And you can't have the academic difficulties that that Doug McDaniel did and those kinds of things if you want to have a successful basketball program. So uh, anyway, I don't I trust that they aren't going to have any of these issues under Dusty May. So and I would love to see as somebody posted over here um, hopes that John Beeline, maybe you can find it, hopes that John Beeline will be brought in as you know maybe as a consultant or something like that i would love that and i believe yeah. uh that if dusty may asked that john beeline would do that i strongly believe that and it, he would be it'd be a no-brainer to me john beeline does not want to be calling plays and doing stuff but if he wants to lend a helping hand and he says hey i can help you identify talent i can talk to people and make some phone calls you know maybe, maybe as a general manager of the program who in the right mind would not use that uh, if you are humble enough and you, you know, to, to use that as a resource, which I think Dusty May is, uh, I would love that. I think that would be great. If he could go around and talk to donors too, you know, and, and help exactly. fundraise and everything else. I mean, who better than the best coach in program history right. to do that? So yeah, that, that relationship to me is another added bonus of the Dusty May hire. The fact that John Beeline was involved with it, the fact that, um, you know, he could be involved with the program going forward it would be massive. It'd be a little odd if maybe he was on the bench or something like that, or even behind the bench, but and I don't think he'd want to be. yeah, I don't think he'd want that. Yeah. I, I agree with, yeah. Yep. So, but in some sort of support role would be fantastic. Um, and that would be great, but you know, going back to the roster, it's like a lot of these guys and, and let's say Terrace Reed does go and, and doesn't come back. Like a lot of these guys were going to go uh, regardless of what Michigan did. So it's not like a, 
you know, like a Sharon Moore situation where, you know, that helped keep a lot of the roster in task intact. Like this was a program that, you know, just went eight and 24. You know, the coach was, you know, I guess seen as on the hot seat. And I guess that was accurate, right? He ended up getting fired. Um, but, you know, they had some issues that, you know, where they were going to have guys leave anyway. They were going to have to replace a ton of guys. There's no limit on the amount of guys you can bring in through the transfer portal. So Michigan should be able to do that. When Dusty May took over at Florida Atlantic uh, in 2018, they only had three returning scholarship players. So he's been in this situation before. Now he brought in a few guys from the JUCO ranks. You're not going to be able to do that at Michigan, but times have completely changed as well. So there are numerous options out there in the transfer portal for Michigan. Connor Siegen went in yesterday from Wisconsin, you know, a kid that always wanted to play for Michigan growing up. So there are going to be guys that, We'll want to play for Dusty May. He's been a hot name over the last year. Players know who he is. And, uh, you know, from everything we've read and heard about him as a relationship builder, uh, he is going to be able to get some guys in here. So, look, a few years ago, we didn't know how how close Michigan was to hitting rock bottom. You know, just a few years later, you go 8-24 and 24 after the Elite Eight. But also in today's college basketball, you're never that far away from being pretty competitive with the transfer portal and everything. So a big few weeks ahead. I want to say with something yeah. here, I want to make something, one thing very, very clear, because you talked about Jawan Howard being on the hot seat, and there were reports that he was expected back. As you guys both knew, uh, you know, as we talked, that was not going to happen. Uh, those were erroneous reports. Uh, there were, this was not going to be a one-man decision. Whoever was leaking news that that Jawan Howard was expected back at Michigan, that was not the case ever. So uh, I think the writing was on the wall there for uh, probably several weeks, uh, you know, unless they went on a run and won five games in the tournament. Um, as a matter of fact, yeah, we'll, we'll stop it there. But there was no – that Juwan Howard was not expected back at Michigan. Yeah, and I want to, again, th- I'm not turning this episode into a ward manual love fest by any no. stretch of the imagination. But he caught a lot of heat for whatever it was five or six weeks ago saying at the time he wasn't considering any changes to the program. Well. I don't know the administrator, an administrator that would do that. I mean, if he had been considering a change at the time, a change probably would have been made. Um, you just don't see sitting athletic directors, you know, speak like Jerry Jones would speak about his head coach, like during an NFL season. Like it was never, you know, I know people want their pound of flesh in real time, but sometimes you just have to let the result speak for itself. I mean, there was never a scenario where, at eight and 24, that that was going to be allowed to continue. And I'm sure that, uh, well, I don't know that his input really would have mattered all that much given how they had gotten to that point, but I'm sure part of the discussion in potentially moving on or not moving on from Jawan Howard was what's your plan to bring us back. And they clearly a coaching change was made and they have, they have their new guy in dusty May. So obviously what happened there speaks for itself. I want to end on the beeline thing because you know, it struck me, you know, I, I, we had talked about it last week, written about it last week on how he was the guy that needs to not just be involved in the search, but needs to be visible and involved at Michigan in general. And, you know, you watch the NCAA tournament this weekend and, you know, it, it struck me that you always see Roy Williams pretty much sitting courtside or not too far uh, from the North Carolina bench. And you see that at a lot of different schools. Um, you know, John Beeline is not a guy that needs to be front and center, Uh but I think I don't think it's crazy to think that he should be that he should be involved. You know, a lot of these schools will run it by their former head coach. You know, what color Gatorade is in you know in the cooler at practice each day, and just silly things like that. I don't. I, I think John Beeline potentially even just having an office in the building, I think is is good. And I think obviously, given everything we talked about, is is something that he's he's up for. And I don't know if it was a uh, I don't know if reports of a fractured relationship with ward manual again there's a lot of he said she said with all that but um the fact that they did work together uh, fits at least the start of a mending of fences that ultimately leads to you know that court should probably be named after him someday the way that it is for a lot of coaches at a lot of other schools that was i walk away incredibly encouraged by that because still a bright mind that has a lot to add uh from a value standpoint so good to Good they were able to do that. I thought your column was great. People took notice of that. And a lot of the people writing, you know, where's John Beeline in this? It wasn't just us. You know, it's funny. There are these factions. There seems to be a faction, maybe 5% of the fan base that 
somehow thinks that John Beeline just needs to disappear or something like that and not be involved in the program in any way. And these people are flat out nuts. There are a few of them on our message boards with all due respect to them, uh, but that's just crazy. Uh, what the hell are you thinking? And, and you know, th- we're talking about culture here. Bo Schembechler had a, a office in Schembechler Hall forever. And Lloyd Carr could do- go down there and pick his brain uh, whenever he wanted to. Uh, he never got in the way, you know, and it, it's not something that John Beeline would do. And everybody's going to say, well, he was he left this program high and dry and so on and so forth. It's funny. They use the same thing about Jawan H- Howard's heart conditioning and think condition. And thank God he's OK. John Beeline had had heart surgery the year before his final year. He was on the road for 30 days, you know, uh, recruiting, trying to replace Jordan Poole and Ignis Brasdakis before out of nowhere, this Cleveland job comes up and he has these talks and he says, look, it's probably going to be easier uh, on my, on my health. You know, I know his family was worried about him. Um, So, but by all means, you take advantage of this resource unless you are absolutely stupid. Okay, number one, that's just a strong opinion. Number two, I will put anything to rest about the he said she she shed about he shed he said she said whatever by the, by the seashore. seashore exactly. Um, there wasn't a relationship there between John Beeline and Ward Manuel. He was as you wrote in your column uh, when he came back. You know they those guys didn't talk. He was sitting up you know in the twenty fifth row or something like that um, when he came back to see some of his players play after he left. Uh, when he, I think it was senior night with Isaiah Livers, he was there one night, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, but I do think, um, you know, they spent some time together over the weekend uh, and hopefully that went well. Uh, you know, he should be, again, uh, his place, uh, if it were up to me and everybody says, oh, you you, you can't you worship John Beeline and stuff like that, so on and so forth. No, but if anybody deserves a statue outside of, Chrysler Arena. First, you put Cassie Russell out there, right? Uh, in my opinion, uh, Glenn Rice should be up there. John Beeline for what he accomplished, guys, with doing it the right way. The cleanest coach in college basketball is, is and it was a landslide. Remember, twenty six percent. I think the next one had nine percent something like that. Uh, 26%. Uh, I remember one time somebody telling me that he was worried that Manny Harris or somebody was getting an extra water on a recruiting visit. Uh, that's how, what a stickler he was for the rules. Spike Albrecht once told me that he was worried there was real rum and rum cake. And Spike was 20 years old or 19 years old. And if you didn't want to give him something with booze in it, just cracks me up. But uh, that's what we're talking about here. And that's why he is such a special coach uh, to me. And that's why you want to run this program. But I thought your column, AB, was fantastic yeah I, thank you i, I, I was, I was being diplomatic with the he said she said yeah it yeah. speaks for itself right yeah. i credit ab with uh with coach b and john b, uh, b line and well hey listen man i got the ball rolling and you went down to florida to close the deal so <laughs> shout out to all of us i guess <laughs> uh any other thoughts on basketball transfer portal it seems I mean, we're gonna have the press conference uh here on tuesday afternoon i'm sure we're Good, a lot to glean from that, and then the work begins. I mean, what is the next step now in terms of, I mean, coaching staff, putting this roster together? It's A lot has to come together very quickly, it feels like. Yeah, there is uh, one of his head assistants. Uh, I think it's Kyle Church, did I write, is, uh, is actually up for the head coaching job. People down there don't think he might think he might not be ready. Um, but if he were to stay, um, in, you know, then he's obviously going to need some assistant coaches. Saudi Washington, we've heard, is um, – at least a candidate for the U of D job. Now I was away this weekend. I didn't see if there was any movement there for the university of Detroit, but um, you know, I would love to see him keep Saudi on board. Uh, frankly, I think Phil Martelli, uh, I think Phil said he has a little gas left in the tank, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me to see him retire. I know that he was living away from his wife and now, uh, you know, those guys got too much heat. Phil Martelli did a good job here. Uh, and, and so did, you know, Saudi Washington, you know, it just didn't work out. It doesn't mean that you can't coach. So, but um, somebody brought up to me, um, one of Dusty Bay's friends, that Dane Fife was actually a good friend of his uh, or, or a colleague of his when they uh, were at Indiana, I believe. So uh, they might be pretty tight. Maybe that's one to watch. But we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, again, this happened so quickly. Um, we should know more tomorrow. I would imagine he's going to move quickly to get those positions filled. Uh, and again, um, we'll see, but, um, people were asking about his recruiting acumen as my buddy told me who used to work with him. He said, this guy has already identified several guys, most likely about who he wants to bring with him, who he wants to recruit. He's an outstanding recruiter an honest guy. He's going to go to the portal. He's going to go to, 
uh, through the high school routes and the, and the ranks. And uh, I believe that there were some promises made about NIL and some, or at least some guarantees guys about NIL and maybe admissions restrictions being relieved. But I will say it's not going to be some guy who took fake classes in another school or didn't decided not to go to class. That's going to be made an exception for, nor should it be at Michigan. And I'm not talking about a Terrence Shannon here who I thought that could have worked, but there are other guys that, that you try to get through that aren't going to get through uh, at a reputable. Well, I shouldn't say that either. That's, kind of but uh at a school like michigan let's put it like that so um but they will be able to get some guys in i think you'll see a few more uh, of those uh transfer restrictions eased everybody talks about admissions and it's not up to admissions and the people i've talked to it's about the deans uh, of the school so uh, we'll see where that goes but uh clearly he was happy with what he heard happy enough to take the job yeah i feel like he's got to do everything at at once right here with the between the staff and getting the roster in shape. I mean, it's still kind of interesting that Namari Burnett and Terrence Williams haven't enter entered the transfer portal, given that they have one more year. They both were honored on senior day uh, and everything like that. So those are, you know, a couple guys to, to watch in addition to the Terrace Reeds of the world that they could convince to come out of the transfer portal. But between Elijah Martin, Nellie Davis, and Vlad Golden, you know, those three, and I, I read too that maybe they could graduate or at least, you know, a couple of them. That would make it easier for them to get in as well. You would think that Dusty May, you know, probably that came up in, in discussions with Michigan, at least I would guess, you know, bringing a couple of those guys with them. That's kind of the added plus to these days of, of having a coaching change as well. You hire a guy. And if he has people like when people were talking about Darian DeVries, you watch Tucker DeVries play for Drake, who's going to be a pro one day. It's like, man, that, you know, kind of a little icing on the cake there if you were to go that direction. But those guys, I mean, Saudi Washington, I'd be interested. I don't know anything about the UDM search either, but he's turned down interest in the past in wanting to stay at Michigan. I wonder if he's a guy that could stay. He was here under Beeline, obviously with Howard, and then uh, you know he he's done a good job. Like was he was he a bad coach last year just because the team wasn't good? But he was a great coach in 2018 and 19. No, of course not. Of course he's a good coach. So I would like to see that too. It would help with continuity. Could you bring John Sanderson back as well? That's something we've talked about, but. Uh, a lot of different options out there. And I got a guy DMing me about Dane Fife as well. So, yeah, maybe that'll come to fruition. As well. Interesting. Uh, too. Yeah. Interesting. Things that make you go, hmm. Well, a lot to do for Dusty May in the early stages of his job. And uh, his peer in the uh, Michigan Athletics, Sharon Moore, who coaches the football team, probably looks at him and goes, yeah, there's a lot to do when you're a head coach because Sharon still has some things to sort out uh, as we move into spring football here. Uh, we are a week into spring ball now, uh, started a week ago uh, today, actually. Um, not a ton of, uh, again, a lot of player buzz expected, a lot of things we've talked about, but they do have a defensive line coach uh, still open. Um, Chris, I know you put out an ITF uh, earlier today on that. Uh, don't need to give away the secrets to the store, of course. We want people to head over to Wolverine.com, and you can use that promo code UM1 to get uh, two months of premium access to our site and get access to inside the fort and other things uh, for $1 for your next two months. So be sure to do that below. But uh, Chris, when we look at this defensive line opening that is still available at Michigan, what's the latest there? And do we think that's something that will be filled during spring ball? Uh, I do. And I think it'll happen probably pretty soon. Uh, hopefully they, the vetting process goes a little faster and, and, uh, you hate to say a little more thorough, you know, but man, that was a black eye. You know what happened with Greg Scruggs? It was disappointing. Uh, I feel bad for uh, him and everybody involved and hope that he's okay, frankly. So, um, but uh, you can't make decisions like that. So uh, expect the resignation when we heard about the details, guys, um, you know, which came out later in the police report. The three of us talked about it and we all pretty much agreed that uh, that wasn't going to last. So, um, but yeah, it stinks, but it is great to have guys like Mason Graham who told us last week and then reiterated, reiterated today that he was coming back um, and, you know, going to be part of this, even though he was, I'm telling you guys, the money that was thrown at him, uh, it takes a special guy and Kenneth Grant, the same way, love these guys, uh, and the kids that they are and that they want to stay here and contribute and build on the culture that they've helped establish here, a national championship culture, guys. I did never, I never thought that I would ever see it again at Michigan. Frankly, I said that. Uh, I think somebody put out a graphic today, two five stars on the roster when every other national championship ha champion had like in the last 10 years or something had five or six. Is that right? Something like that. So I mean, it's gotta be. Yeah. Yeah. That's talent identification. That's talent development. 
And that's finding guys like this who are absolute monsters. So, um, and another great kid to boot. So I'm looking forward to a good year. Uh, from what we've heard, guys, they are very bullish on this team. They are excited about what they've seen from the offensive line in the early going, the very early going. Feeling really good, as Sharon Moore said about the cornerbacks, you know, which was another question. So um, I, you know what? I got the I got the football bug. I'm not wishing my summers away anymore. You know, I'm no spring chicken anymore. But uh, I can't wait till football season, fellas. Yeah, and, I, and as Sharon said on Thursday with the O-line, he reserves judgment until they have pads on. They probably had, what, one or two mm -hmm. padded practices. So we'll see how it goes. I, I, I you know, think the O-line could be pretty good this year. I mean, at some point, like, it's kind of weird because you you think about it and you're like, oh, shoot, they lost their top six offensive linemen. But you more have to think about it in the in the sense that it's amazing Zach Zinter and Trevor Keegan, all those guys stayed as long as they did. I mean, over 40 starts for a couple of those guys at Michigan. You had a couple of guys from the transfer portal that were big additions. You have the same thing this year with at least one. We'll see what they do in the spring. But that's going to be one, you know, you're going to ride that defense. And Mason Graham said that even last year, but even more so this year, they feel like they they want to carry the team. They want the team to be dependent on the defense. They want to be the, the, uh, the side of the ball that has to make that crucial play or that big stop. And, of course, we saw that on a number of occasions last year. So, But you're going to ride the defense. You're going to have a new quarterback, whoever that is. That O-line needs to be really good and solid to help out the rest of the operation, at least in early on in the season. Big game against Texas early. Uh, you know, you got to have at least a few of those. You know, defense is going to be good. you got to be solid on offense, control the line of scrimmage in a big game when you don't know exactly what you're going to get out of your quarterback. But – I'm excited, too. Um, I'm excited for the spring game, first and foremost, less than a month away. Air on Fox as well. That, that was announced today, which will be kind of cool to give everybody a look at the national champs. Can't hurt, right? Um, you know, when, it look, when you look at the defensive side of the ball and that offensive line, too, it kind of reminds me of, you know, back in the day, you know, before there was a salary cap in the NHL. I think back to, like, those Red Wings teams of the early 2000s where, you know, you had Pavel Datsuk and, and Henrik Zetterberg who were would go on to be Hall of Famers, basically getting extra reps overseas or in Grand Rapids and not really ready to come up until some of those those Hall of Famers, some of those foundational guys moved on. And with that offensive line, I mean, I think uh, Gio, Giovanni Elhadi uh, could have started if, if there was an injury. You know, he did start two years ago, could have easily started last year. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of those guys, I think Greg Crippen, um, even as early as last year may have been a starter given, but you know, you bring in Olu Ola Timmy, you bring in Drake Nugent, and, and that was a strength of those guys. And, you know, I want to, I want to kind of steer towards, uh, we talked to Donovan Edwards today and, and Clayton, you had written about this, um, you know, from his press conference where he talks about getting the fire back in him after a year that was, I guess you could say, I mean, certainly from a production standpoint, a step back for him, but you know, we had the knee procedure in the off season uh, Blake Corm had come back and was going to be that lead back. He didn't play in spring ball. And he just felt like a combination of factors for as confidently, um, you know, for as much confidence as maybe he projected last off season, it didn't show up on the field a ton. And, and, you know, he found his groove late in the year than obviously in the biggest game of his life against Washington. But we get to talk to him today and he comes out, he's 14 pounds heavier. He's a little more rocked up. As I think Kirk Campbell said a couple of weeks ago, he's a guy that you get the sense that, um, you know, finally being healthy, heading into a full off season, heading into spring ball. I mean, he's getting his body right, not necessarily to be more of a short yardage back, but to be a guy that can take some more of the hits and run through contact a little better. And uh, I think uh, Donovan's a guy that I think the, the year of perspective he got um, to me, it almost kind of rings. It rings like Rocky three where Rocky got a little too high on his own product, got knocked, knock back down again or knock back down a peg. And, you know, you find that eye of the tiger, so to speak, or in his case, the eye of the Wolverine. And now you're, uh, you're back on the back to building towards something, but a guy that you think is, is probably going to be the lead back for this team at the very least be a one, a one B type of thing. And uh, I thought the perspective we heard from him in Monday's press conference, Clayton, uh, you know, it was, it was a little bit different, but also vintage Donovan at the same time. Yeah, it was as impressive of a of a press conference and as honest as someone 
has been uh, that I've had, you know, or heard in a while, um, you know, and it was, yeah, it was kind of the same Donovan Edwards, but also just a completely more mature and, you know, introspective Donovan Edwards as well. And I asked him about that knee surgery that he had last year, um, which is something I wondered about throughout the year. Like how much are we overlooking maybe how that held him back? He didn't get to participate in spring ball last year, you know, maybe didn't seem to have quite the leg strength that he would have liked to have didn't run through contact well enough. And, you know, he said it set him back tremendously. Um, you know, he added the 14 pounds as he talked about up to 214. He said he wants to be at least over 210 in terms of, uh, you know, to help him with durability, not necessarily to, to carry the load as a short yardage back. I think that comment was more about, you know, not having an, an issue there with being a short yardage back. I think he's confident in his ability to do that. And we'll see kind of how it's split up between him and Kalel Mullings. But um, yeah, I mean, I thought it was, it was, you know, good insight from him. He talked about the rest of the running back room. He's now uh, stepped up as a leader. He said it would be a disservice if I just, you know, worked hard and, and did everything for myself. I want to bring guys along with me and they need that on this team. You're losing a bunch of good leaders on this team. But when we asked Makari page today about who stepped up as a leader, he had a bunch of names to rattle off. So they got guys that were, behind those other guys that watched and learned were leaders in their own way last year and now are going to step up. And I think Donovan's, you know, kind of a prime example of that. Who were some of those guys? Uh, KG, Mason, he mentioned Donovan. You know, Macari Page is quiet, but, you know, he probably is himself. He said Rod Moore has stepped up big time oh. as a leader, and we know he was already one, but it's a little bit different when you're a senior, I think. Uh, and then Donovan said there's like two leaders in every position room as well. Um, you know, and he talked about you know, Colston Loveland in the tight ends room and multiple, more than two in the offensive line room. So I think that's going to be really big for this team, the standard that they set. And Macari Page said a lot of the leadership that they're doing is now they have this standard, which is national champions. They're standing there in front of a background that has the logo of 2023 national champs. That's what they're holding the young guys to. They so should. That's, that's a good place to start from. Success breeds success, fellows. And it's just like Doug Skeen, my podcast partner, always says. He said, we knew, man, we did not want to let those guys down after the fact, you know. Um, and he said classes before us and the classes before them and the guys that won championships. And, of course, they lost that during the Rich Rod era. That was one of the things when it was a high risk, high reward, higher with Rich Rod. You know, you you're, you risk alienating that and losing your culture, and they did. Uh, and it was tough to overcome. They needed a guy like Jim Harbaugh to do it. Now, the hope is that Sharon Moore is has that culture ingrained in him as well. Uh, you know, he does not have the experience. People can sit there and say, well, yeah, he was the obvious hire, and we did too, and we were all for giving him the shot, but this is not going to be easy. So, um, but I love the fact that he was part of building that culture. I love the love who he is, uh, and I love his recruiting chops. Uh, you know, he's going to work his butt off to make this program great. And the leadership that you saw and that you've seen, Donovan Edwards will be a captain on this team, I guarantee it, is one of the byproducts of that. It's fantastic. Yeah, you're right. You know, the success breeds the success. And when you look at these teams that have been successful and won national championships, you know, in the college football playoff era, they've all been programs that before that there's been a standard set and there have been guys that there's been leadership that you kind of take the baton from. And, um, you know, you, I think it was Donovan who said, you know, I learned how to lead from guys like Aiden Hutchinson and Josh Ross. And then they learned how to lead or the guys after you know, your Mozzie Smiths of the world, um, your Mike Morris is some of those other guys, you know, you keep passing the baton to that next group. And it's why this program does have a chance to be sustainably successful under Sharon Moore is because the nucleus of this team are all guys that have been here. Certainly last year, a lot of them, the year before that, some of them uh, in 2021. So, you know, again, you have success based on your players, you have success based on your player leadership. And right now, I mean, Again, it's going to take some, they have some special guys, you know, to fill the, you know, big shoes to fill from that perspective. But you look at the guys that you just kind of keep backfilling. It's, I think they're in really good hands there. And that doesn't mean they're without questions. Doesn't mean they're going to have a perfect season. Most teams don't have a perfect season, but you know, when you look at the foundation of what's there, uh, you just continue to hear all the right things. And, and you know, maybe the, the, it's not the worst thing in the world to have, a different voice and a bit of a different perspective uh, coming off the year that they just had, because now it's a different group of coaches that are chasing perfection. It's a different group of starters that are chasing that perfection. So uh, to me, uh, certainly so far, again, for as 
as encouraged as you can be by spring football. Uh, pretty good start, it seems like, on all accounts. So uh, I want to do – I don't know that we'll have – a ton of time for questions, but I did want to get into uh, this topic briefly uh, on three. It, it was Jesse Simonton uh, earlier today who put out a head coach power rankings for uh, for the big 10 heading into the 2024 football season. And Jerome Moore came in, where is it here? Uh, I believe he was ninth on the list. And listen, we could debate the merits of the list all day long, but I want, I want us to look at this ranking here and predict, if you will, as we look forward, um, who, by the time this first season is over, when you see Sharon Moore at number nine and some of the other guys at the top of the list, you know, you have Ryan Day at one, Lincoln Riley from USC is at number two, Dan Lanning's at three uh, from Oregon, James Franklin at four, Kirk Ferentz at five, Luke Fickle, Matt Rule, Jonathan Smith, all ahead of Sharon Moore. By the end of this season, where do we think he is in this conversation? Because... Um, I certainly don't think it goes backwards. I think he can only go up, upwards from here. And actually, maybe a little bit surprising to see him that low. But uh, when you look at this season, uh, where do we see Sharon more fitting in in terms of this hierarchy? That's a great question. Uh, and th these lists are kind of ridiculous, right? Because, um, you know, it's kind of like putting out a preseason poll. How do you um, judge a guy who's coached four games as an interim coach? Right, exactly. So... Uh, and so, you know, Jonathan, Jonathan Smith, um, who knows, you know, he'll probably fall because Michigan state will probably win like four or five games. Right. Um, so become worse as a coach. Right. So, and that doesn't make any sense today. Any, right. Exactly. And he has a chance. He'll have a chance just like Sharon Moore to move back up as he continues to build his program. So, yeah. um, these are just lists to, to get people talking. Uh, they don't mean a whole lot. I think Luke fickle could probably move down a little, um, you know, I'm not overly impressed with him. Um, so Ryan Day at number one, you know, can't beat his rival, tells you everything you need to know, right? So, um, but, uh, yeah, you know, my my really what I would say is who, who really cares, you know? In fact, I'd probably put Jed Fish over over Sharon Moore right now just because of what he accomplished at Arizona. He accomplished more as a, as a head coach so far, but that doesn't mean he's a better coach. So, you know, it's really the criteria. It's kind of goofy, the whole thing. I agree. Jed, Jed is too low. Um, but again, then we're feeding into it. Right. Like, these things are so dumb in my opinion. I, I don't blame Jesse for writing no, it not at by all. any means because it is interesting and, and mm -hmm. we're talking about it. Um, and, and a lot of it is good and insightful and it, you know, helps people understand what the landscape looks like here. But like when Jim Harbaugh kept moving down and down and down on these national coaching lists, it was like 15, you know, or maybe he was 18th one year, but then they won the Big Ten, and then he was up at eighth. It's like he can well, coach again, better, and then now he's fourth. And like, is he getting better, or is it just kind of how your team's performing? Performing. So it's another way to look at the power rankings. I will say, uh, Megan, can we scroll down a little bit more to the bottom there? Hate to see Walty, my guy Walty, at 17. <laughs> Walty. Brian Walters just, of Purdue just had to get the Walty one in there. Yeah, I mean it's. Uh... I mean, I asked him question, uh, the question where he would rank here uh, or where you think he would rank by the end of the year. I mean, if Sheryl Moore goes out and wins the Big Ten, he'll be number one. Uh, if they go eight and four, maybe he's where he is right now. I don't know. Um, just a thought exercise as we get ourselves. Would you put Ryan Day? Sh should Ryan Day be third for third base? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we I'll should tell you what, though. Separate, separate category for guys born on third, right? Yeah, well, apparently Jim Harbaugh was still talking about that at uh, I think the owners' meetings are going on right now in Orlando. Jim Harbaugh so. would be number one on this list, right? If he came back, oh yeah, no question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know something. Trying to keep things in house and yep. get the conversation going, so maybe a miss on my part. But oh, right. um, we do have a couple Not questions here. Uh, let's go to Kyle Reed, who says, "What are the biggest risks of a Dusty May hire?" As Chris has the spinning disc of death there. Yeah, I mean it's it's what we you talked a little bit about earlier. It's just like it's so hard to project. Like it's hard to project when you have up transfers. A B like you know a Mike Smith when he came from Columbia and he did a good job, you know. But then Devontae Jones the next year at point guard coming from Coastal Carolina, like how is he going to fit in the Big Ten? It's kind of similar for coaches as we lost Chris there. Hopefully he rejoins here in a second. Um, I guess my question was so stupid that he. Uh... <laughs> He decided to no, just bounce off. Them. By the way, it was not a miss by you at all uh, on that topic. 
Um, I, I just think the rankings are there. It's just such a fascinating type of. Ranking. Yeah. I, Especially I, it's for just more year head coaches. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it was just interesting to see the perception and see, I don't know. I don't know where it goes again. It could, it could change, but yeah, we won't fixate on that, but, but, but the risk, you know, the biggest, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, the risk is I mean, there's risk involved with every hire. I've said this a million times. I feel like, you know, to me, there's no such thing as a home run hire. Um, you know, Jim, Har a guy like Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. That's maybe the closest thing you can get in that regard, just in terms of how, you know, the effort it took to pull that off. And like, you knew he was going to be relatively successful one way or another. And to a certain extent, yeah, I do feel that way about Dusty May, but I, I'm a believer in just the best hire you can make. And, you know, when you're fighting with other high major schools, uh, especially Louisville, who, again, like Michigan, has – I'll say they competed for a national title. I don't know if they won it or not because the NCAA vacated that year. It's tough to say, you know, who comes out of that year as, as the rightful champion or not. But, you know, Louisville's a they, – they have a crazy basketball fan base. And, again, you know, you thought – we had even talked about, I feel like on the show we did last week where you talk, you know, the war chesting that they had allegedly available to them to build a roster, you know, it wouldn't have surprised me at all if he went there, but the biggest risk is um, I think the biggest risk you can take when making a head coaching hire is trying to just win the press conference with a name. And in a lot of you, like if, if another big game, big name guy, had become available that has had success in the past, but maybe not so much the last few years. I think you're, you're making a hire just to get a name in there. Whereas, uh, you know, Dusty may, I think is one of the rare candidates in this cycle where I think he checks both boxes. So, uh, the risk is the, I guess the risk would be for Michigan's end and maybe promising something that you can't fully deliver on, whether it pertains to NIL or admissions or what have you, but I don't see any risk in hiring Dusty may. I think it's, uh, I don't know how high the reward will be, but I do think that he'll be a net positive for sure. Yeah, and there's it's not like a risk specific to Dusty May. It's just a risk specific to college basketball. And like you're not guaranteed to win anything. And I think Dusty May knows that. And then we have also Coach Jim for UM on the message board said, what excites you most about the Dusty May hire? Uh, May hire? We talked about it a little bit earlier as well, but I, I want to mention this story too because it's from The Athletic, but – to, to exemplify what Chris was talking about with how relentless he is and how much of a worker he is, when he was a student manager in the late 90s under Bob Knight at Indiana, he was sitting there on the bench during practice writing out note cards, diagramming plays, and uh, you know writing notes about practice. A loose ball comes right by him. He didn't even notice, and Bob Knight was all over him, pissed at him because he didn't grab the loose ball you know, and throw it back into play. But he was so... Uh, into his note cards there that, you know, he he didn't want to do that. So that's how hard of a worker is. That's how, you know, much he's going to work. And to me, the fact that he was able to figure it out at a lesser program like Florida Atlantic gives me a lot of optimism. All right. Well, I hear the bat phone going off on the other end of the podcast there. I know, Clayton, uh, you have another obligation. So we will close things out here. Uh, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, thanks uh, a ton uh, to Bruce or Megan behind the scenes. Uh, Chris Ballas, who uh, is in the phantom zone somewhere. We'll, we'll make sure we get contact and make sure he's all right. We've got a press conference to cover tomorrow, so be sure to like and subscribe. We'll have a ton of video coming from that. Um, for my co-host, for producer Megan behind the scenes, I'm Anthony Broom. We will talk to you again next time. Thanks for tuning in.